behalf of the government and people of South Africa, I wish to thank the University of Oxford for organizing this conference on 20 years of South African democracy. We are humbled as a nation by this remarkable level of interest in the progress we are making and the difficulties we've encountered since the onset of democracy in our country 20 years ago. This is neither fleeting nor facile interest, but one stemming from the long period of solidarity dating back to the era of the liberation struggle. In view of this continued international solidarity, government cannot afford to fail in its duty to the people of South Africa, for doing so would amount to a betrayal of historical proportions. At a broader level, all the people of our nation, irrespective of political affiliation, race, class, and gender, in other words, the broadest cross-section of society, owe it to themselves in the first instance to ensure that our country succeeds. Ladies and gentlemen, in accordance with the theme of this conference, I will attempt to share my understanding of South Africa's transition from apartheid to democracy as well as assess the all too critical issue of post-apartheid effort to consolidate democracy. Further, I would also like to look at the impact of social dialogue as a mechanism that unlocked the possibility of a broad consensus that sustains the South African vision till today. In so far as social dialogue enabled all key parties to the conflict to come together in a multi-vocal process, it made possible the emergence of a political mainstream which, fissured as it was, was bound together by the universal interest in seeking common ground, a broad consensus, to move the country forward. In cementing the political mainstream together, through a shared interest in the resolution of conflict, social dialogue unleashed centripetal tendencies that prefigured the current non-racial democracy. With this in mind, let me attempt to surface my understanding of what the consolidation of democracy is. Even though the fullest extent of this historical period does not lend itself easily to neat theoretical framework, at least such an outline will help us conceive of the nature of the problem at hand better. However, before attempting to construct this broad definition, let me emphasize that South Africa is a constitutional republic. At minimum, our system of democracy entails judicial independence, a bill of rights that safeguards human rights, free and fair elections, the right to hold public office, as well as separation of powers. Consolidating democracy entails strengthening institutions and cultures that underpin these democratic procedures. Democracy is considered consolidated when it becomes in internalized behaviorally, <laughs> attitudinally, and constitutionally. For our purposes, consolidating democracy would also include the following elements, five elements. First, existing conditions for the development of free and lively civil society. Second, the existence of an autonomous political society. This entails the arena in which political actors compete for legitimate right to exercise control over public power and the state apparatus, its core institutions being political parties, legislatures, elections, electoral rules, political leadership, and inter-party alliances. And third, government and state apparatus being subjected to a rule of law that protects individual freedoms. And fourthly, the existence of a state bureaucracy to protect rights of citizens and to deliver other basic services. And lastly, there must exist an institutionalized economic society. This means a set of norms, regulations, policies, and institutions that sustain a mixed economy. 
In the final analysis, the concept of consolidation is generally viewed as the ultimate end goal where no one can imagine acting outside of established institutional democratic practices because those institutions and practices have become deeply uh, ingrained within society. I would argue that all the above conditions are a reality in post-apartheid South Africa. What may be contested is the extent of each of these conditions. Further, I would also argue that the permanence of these conditions that underline the process of democratic consolidation is by no means in doubt. What is also often forgotten is that while democracy is a universal political experience, it is also a culture and not a method that can simply be transposed from one part of the world <coughs> to the other. For democracy to hold in South Africa, it has to evolve organically within local conditions, bond with our peculiarities, during which it will experience growing pains and teething problems. Nonetheless, it is incontestable. It is incontestable that a consolidated democracy would be one that does not need dependence on any social or political actors or agency for its durability. It is an impersonal experience which over time becomes self-perpetuating. Once the first transition has been accomplished, the process of reaching democratic consolidation consists of eliminating the institutions, procedures, and expectations that are incompatible with the minimum workings of democratic regime, thereby permitting the beneficent ones that are created or recreated within the transition to a democratic government to develop further. Our current focus in terms of undoing the material and ideological legacy of apartheid, as well as building a culture of democracy, are attuned to this broad definition of consolidating democracy. Since transition can mean many things, it is also advisable to throw some light on the concept. Transition may mean movement of society from one socioeconomic formation to another. Historically, such a transition is invariably preceded by a revolution, the wholesale dismantling of social, political, and economic institutions that define a particular socioeconomic formation. In our case, by transition we mean the process from the apartheid state to the democratic state, which took place within the framework of the same socioeconomic formation. In fact, the nature of the economic system within which the transition to democracy occurred had no small role in shaping the character of the post-apartheid society, especially in economic terms, as I will argue later. Having said that, I would like to contend that transitioning from apartheid to democracy was a single indivisible process, albeit marked by different historical phases. The first phase comprised the multi-party negotiation process, and the second was marked by the inauguration of the democratic state. South Africa is currently undergoing the second phase in that it is been consolidating democracy since the inauguration of the democratic state. Program director, to a large extent, the transition from apartheid to democracy, which was made possible by multi-party political dialogue, decidedly configured the nature of the post-apartheid regime. Yet, the process of political dialogue was itself shaped by the conjuncture of international and national conditions. Firstly, at the global level, the world was undergoing a historical transformation from the era of Cold War, which had, all, which had till then reflected the global balance of power to the stage where the Eastern Bloc was collapsing. 
the all too self-evident unassailability of neoliberalism as the only viable economic system suffused the political climate not only in South Africa but the world over. Francis Fukuyama's Lent Mark Tome, the end of history and the last man was a crowning moment in the international environment where neoliberal conception of human society was assuming omnipotence. The Soviet Union, which had until then been looked at by liberation movements in the developing world as a source of material support and whose existence had ensured equal global balance of power, was unraveling in ways never thought possible before, as was socialism as the vision of organizing human society. Secondly, the multi-party process for a negotiated settlement of South Africa's future took place under conditions of political equilibrium, where the African National Congress had not defeated the apartheid regime, and the apartheid regime <coughs> had not defeated the African National Congress either. The late ANC stalwart Joe Slovo summed up the pre-negotiation imperatives neatly when he stated that, and I quote, we are negotiating because towards the end of the 80s, we concluded that as a result of its escalating crisis, the apartheid power bloc was no longer able to continue ruling in the old way and was genuinely seeking some break with the past. At the same time, we were clearly not dealing with a defeated enemy and an early revolutionary seizure of power by the liberation movement could not be realistically posed, close quote. So in real terms, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the stagnation of the South African economy, combined with international and domestic onslaught against apartheid, opened up perceptual possibilities for both sides in the conflict to pursue their sectoral interests through peaceful means. Against this background, objective conditions existed that compelled the primary political actors, the ANC and the apartheid regime, to seriously consider negotiated settlement as the only viable option for the future of the country. We entered the negotiation process confident that it would lead to a democratic dispensation, which would in turn provide ideal conditions to transform society in accordance with the objectives of the liberation struggle. As it turned out, the transition from apartheid to democracy in South Africa counted as a unique political experience in modern history. Little wonder that most observers, both in South Africa and the world, would describe it as a miracle. What made this possible? Of course, one of the reasons for this unprecedented historical experience was visionary leadership. Aside from the all-inclusive post-apartheid vision the ANC advocated, there was also the issue of compromise. At the heart of transition is the old truism that those who rule authoritarian societies do not voluntarily surrender their power and hence do not willingly renounce control over the political systems in which that power is located nor do they modify or reform these systems in ways that are likely to jeopardize existing power relations. Rather, the rulers typically resist demands for profound systemic and structural change, and no appeal by those excluded from the political decision-making processes will prevail, even if morally or morality or justice would thereby be saved. We knew then, as we do now, that the apartheid ruling bloc sought a new dispensation that did not change the essentials of racial privilege in the economic and social arena. At the same time, we also knew that if the transition process was to move with the necessary speed, some compromises would have to be made to unlock such possibilities. These included a sunset clause in the Constitution 
which could provide for the compulsory power sharing for a fixed number of years in the period immediately following the adoption of the Constitution. The fact that the liberation movement had not achieved an outright victory on the battlefield meant that it had to accept compromises in negotiations <coughs> which would allow the ruling bloc to ease itself out of power without undue resistance. The perspective of, gov of the government of national unity and the entrenchment of some of the rights of the existing public service, including the security forces, the judiciary and the parastatals were major elements of this approach. The spirit of engagement and rational discourse also enabled us to draw in both black and white elements who had distrusted the dialogic <coughs> process, fearing that it would endanger their self-interests. So, coupled with the readiness on our part to make compromises, where it was prudent to do so, dialogue transfigured an apparently hopeless negotiation landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, in defining the consolidation of democracy, some thinkers have argued that under conditions where the outgoing authoritarian regime still wields some form of power under the rubric of tutelary power, democratic consolidation will be a difficult exercise. History is awash with cases where post-authoritarian regimes failed to effect meaningful changes due to inability to eradicate all incompatible political institutions reflecting the interests of the previous regime. Indeed, in some cases, the inability to bring about real social change hugs back to compromises made during this transition period itself. Yet South Africa managed to make concessions without strangulating the possibility of social change in the long term. For instance, the retention of apartheid civil servants was meant to last up to five years and there would be no veto powers for political handovers, holdovers from the past regime who could then use such powers to thwart transformation. Once again, the type of leadership at the helm of the transition, transitional process understood the imperatives of the moment, thereby providing the required level of leadership despite the difficulties some of the unpopular choices entailed. The specter of orchestrated violence tormented communities posing real danger to the process of negotiations. In point of fact, such was the nature of violence that many in the liberation movement began to debate the, adv the advisability of continuing with negotiations while people faced such conditions. Once again, leadership came to the fore. Following a robust internal debate within the ranks of the liberation camp, it was resolved that dialogue had to continue till the apartheid regime dissolved. Looking back, one is astonished by the fragility of the negotiation process that could have easily collapsed, unleashing all manner of centrifugal forces on society. All this goes to show how critical leadership is at all levels of society. Political thinkers also speak of the perversity of democracy occasioned by reserved domains of authority and policy, which impairs the capacity of post-transitional societies. Such domains of authority refer to designated areas from the previous regime left untouched by the transition process as a way of encouraging the regime to hand over the reins of power. They facilitate transition in that they assure members of the authoritarian regime that their interests would not be hurt by the democratic state. We have already explained that whatever compromises were made <coughs> did not undermine the democratic state's obligation to bring about social <coughs> emancipation. In explaining the compromises that became the centerpiece of our approach, Joe Slovo clearly states, and I quote, 
we must distinguish between what I choose to call qualitative compromises, which imply a surrender of the whole or part of a substantive demand and quantitative compromises which allow for a degree of elasticity within otherwise fixed parameters, close quote. So against this sketchy background about the nature of our transition to democracy, under what conditions did pro the process of consolidating democracy begin? Foremost in the national psyche was the theme of national reconciliation, a refrain that permeated the recesses of societal imagination. It cemented our oneness, yet credit should go to the individuals who became national spokespersons of this goal, throwing their commanding stature behind the vision of a united society. In every age, men and women of rare qualities issue forth to stamp their imprint on the firmament of history, leaving humanity the better for it. Many would agree that South Africa was fortunate to have such personalities who, while working within the broader context of mass struggles, made their individuality felt on the course of events. Along with these unifying themes that impacted positively on social cohesion, was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, an initiative that became a cathartic exercise by enabling both victims and perpetrators of gross human rights abuses to come forth and reconcile. It was clearly understood that there could be no reconciliation without truth. What makes South Africa's democratization process interesting is that we keep reverting to our past, both distant and recent, to draw necessary lessons to help us navigate the rapids found in the present era. One such lesson that has seen South Africa survive the worst that could have happened is the key issue of social dialogue. Social dialogue has been the bedrock upon which consensus was and is built to crack the most difficult socio-political situations. Conflicts of all sorts are endemic to all democratizing societies. South Africa is no exception. The shape of present day South Africa has been wrought by this doctrine in social conflicts. Once again, political thinkers provide us with useful theoretical framework to comprehend the value of consensus for South Africans struggling with the reality of post-apartheid challenges. South Africa's democratic consolidation holds because it is based on consensus within the political community. In this regard, I wish to break down consensus into two component parts all of which contribute to, the, to South African stability. Firstly, South Africa has consensus over ultimate values. While ultimate values are normally not seen as possible in a society that is heavily internally fissured along racial, ethnic, religious, and linguistic lines, especially when such a society has just emerged from autocracy, South Africa is arguably holding its own on this front. For this, South Africa can thank the Mandela phenomenon, epitomizing the essential goodness of the struggle in classical sense. The epic figure of Nelson Mandela radiated values that have not only transcended the barriers mentioned above, but also bound most South Africans together. These values could be said to offer South Africans something to live for. They point to a shared, indivisible feature in which all South Africans have a stake. In a way, they have morphed into a legitimizing philosophy for our democratic state. The strategic vision of the liberation struggle was defined by the key goal of the achievement of a united, democratic, non-racial, 
non-sexist and just society. Throughout his life, Nelson Mandela was shaped by this very vision of which he subsequently became a distinctive embodiment in words and in deed. Inspired by this vision, most South Africans across race, class, and political affiliation are alive to both the nature and scope of responsibility with which we are faced at this point in history. Differentiated as they may be by a polarizing history, most South Africans are nevertheless bonded by a deep conviction in the achievability of the dream of a prosperous nation united in diversity. This climate of positive thinking about our future throws up ideal conditions for the consolidation of ascendant values that bind our nascent nation together. In this connection, the demise of Nelson Mandela left us a legacy which shines an eternal light to our aspired future. The second type of consensus that defines our current state of democratic consolidation is rules procedure, which refers to minimizing disloyalty by binding all players to obtaining rules by dint of fairness and equality for all. Of course, the challenge here is that we should always strive to maintain higher standards of fairness for once some participants start perceiving unfairness or that rules of procedure are loaded against them, the process will wobble and probably collapse. With the legitimacy of the rules of procedure intact, no one player can just walk away from the process of engagement, make it easy for all of us to employ the same vehicle to resolve our differences. The benefit we hope to derive from this dimension of consensus is that the institutions that underpin democracy, namely the rules of procedure, assume a life of their own, becoming not only impersonal but self-perpetuating, often in a virtuous cycle. Thus rooted in societal culture, it becomes second nature to all members of society that no one is above the law in all its phases of society, including the constitution, the police, the courts, labor bargaining councils, and all other institutions that either govern lives or serve as arbiters or interpreters of the law. Program director would be insincere if I did not reflect on the political state of South Africa today given the importance of the present conditions on the evolving contours of the future of our democracy. As you are aware, South Africa was conceived in racial inequity. Our socio-historical self-consciousness was cast in impermeable racial molds from the very beginning of our nation. This is an important dimension to bear in mind as we look at the 20 years of democracy in terms of transitioning from the apartheid state and attempting to understand the process of consolidating democracy. The legacy of the past racist economic policies remains the dominant reality on current socioeconomic landscape. Essentially, apartheid was about racially skewed production, distribution, and consumption of resources. Despite all our successes from the moment we entered into a transitional period to a post-apartheid political system, we are convinced that democracy cannot be consolidated on the basis of history alone. This is an all-important point to note, for as long as the majority of South Africans languish in hunger, ho homelessness, illiteracy, and diseases, among other social ills, for so long, will our system of democracy hang on a thread. Put differently, our system of democracy cannot survive long in social conditions that hold out nothing for the majority of the population. The real challenge for us 
It has been to forge an economic program which allows us to overcome the inherited economic structure by steadily moving to an economic approach which will liberate the productive forces and lead to a better society. In this regard, we have since 1994 tried a few economic programs, including recently the National Development Plan to address these accumulated disabilities of our history. The National Development Plan has been generally acceptable as the roadmap to the attainment of growth and development. The NDP has laid out the parameters within which each social partner can make a contribution towards the achievement of our shared vision. This shared vision entails the reduction of poverty, stimulating economic growth, effecting economic transformation and creating employment. Ineluctably, the achievement of these goals is partly predicated on the role of an engaged private sector. This role has to be seen within the context of a broad and continued social dialogue comprising government, the private sector, labor unions, and social society as primary players. It is also notable that we are seeking to bring about comprehensive socioeconomic changes within an unchanged socio-economic formation, which in turn is imposing limitations on what the democratic state can do. We have to succeed in our objectives in the context of an accelerated process of globalization, which is leading to a greater integration of the nations of the world, the limitation of the sovereignty of states, and the growing disparities between the rich and the poor. The struggle to transform South African society and emancipate ourselves takes place within a concrete and ever-changing national and international environment. This environment calls upon all of us whose sights are set on democratic transformation to pursue our objective, always mindful of the changes as well as the subjective and the objective factors which characterize this environment. Yet, an observer cannot miss the point that the exercise of state power throws up its own challenges in all societies. Indeed, post-colonial history is choking on such cases, South Africa included. This is shown by the huge appetite for the dishonest means of wealth accumulation that has emerged over the 20 years of our exercise of state power. While we are seeking to change society from the noxious past to a refreshing present marked by human rights, justice, and prosperity, the economic system we are living through is also changing us. This is the challenge that faces the African National Congress in power today. <clears throat> we have designated this phenomenon the sins of incumbency. By this, I'm not suggesting a mechanical view that says we are trapped in a rotten post-apartheid life about which we cannot do anything. Indeed, change is possible. It takes the courage of leadership to come to terms with this malady in ways that help the organization cleanse itself of these conditions. It cannot be a matter of wishful thinking Steps have to be taken to bring up a generation of committed cadres with a singular purpose to help move society forward. One of our biggest challenges is state capacity to deliver services to society. Oftentimes, government has found itself between a rock and a hard place. Government has had to rely on the bureaucratic machinery to implement its program of social transformation. However, this has not always been easy. In his book, Beyond the Miracle, veteran journalist, political analyst, and author Alistair Sparks observes that, and I quote, apartheid's legacy of poor education for the majority of the population and the way the job reservation laws favoring whites truncated the skills base of our working class, close quote. 
Former senior public servant Barry Gilder makes a point more lucidly when he explains that, and I quote, many of, many of us drawn into the public sector had little or no experience of governing, of managing large organizations and budgets, of the complex and incomprehensible processes and procedures we were suddenly expected to follow, of myriad law and regulations we had to comply with, of the requirement upon us. And we were charged by history and our own beliefs with providing health, education, employment, welfare services, and freedom to the four-fifths of the population previously neglected by apartheid, close quote. Many of the current social protests witnessed in South Africa's urban landscape can be ascribed to these discontents of history. Moving on, we have to address all these deficiencies as a matter of agency. On the strength of social dialogue, we have the possibility to draw on the talents in society to address these challenges within the framework of a developmental state. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by reasserting that despite all odds, South Africans are determined to make the process of democratization irreversible. We have made a historic transition from a system condemned by the United Nations as a crime against humanity to a democratic society. Transitioning from apartheid to democracy saw the emergence of mainstream society bound together by the vision of a united, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist, and just society. Social dialogue played a key role in this regard helping us to build broad consensus that saw the whole spectrum of political community drawn into the multi-party dialogic process. We have since been wrestling with the intricacies of strengthening democracy in the face of some testing challenges. We have embarked on a process to address these defi key deficiencies. As we do that, we are also confronting the specter of corruption, a weak state, and some of the discontents of history. Similarly, we have launched a frontal attack on these maladies. It would not be fair to look at our state of democracy as if it is coeval with mature democracies, which, despite their deep historical roots, would still not adequately satisfy some of the five points of democratic consolidation mentioned above. Democracy is a process. More importantly, democracy is embedded in social conditions, and its thriving presupposes social justice and expanding flow of human comfort. I am confident in the creative spirit of South Africans to elevate our democratic experience to the level where democratic practice becomes a second nature. Despite all odds, there will be a way. In this, I am inspired by the penetrating wisdom of the novelist Bernard Malamut. And I quote, there comes a time in a man's life when to get where he has to, if there are no doors or windows, he walks through the wall." Close quote. And I thank you for your kind attention.